This video covers the first part of Chapter 7, Sports Psychology, for PSY 120, Careers in Psychology, Neuroscience, and Human Development. In this chapter, we're going to look at the broad area of sports psychology, and as we usually do, uh, we'll talk about bachelor's level opportunities as well as those requiring a graduate degree. In our previous chapter covering health psychology, I mentioned that there are some overlaps, some natural connections between um, health psychology and sport psychology. There are also many overlaps in the clinical and counseling realm. Um, so keep an eye out for some of those overlaps and connections as we move through this chapter. <clears throat> sport psychology, just very generally, is the study of how psychology is applicable to all aspects of sport, um, whether it's its performance or um, related to uh, how how athletes can improve their performance, how they can remove roadblocks to their performance, how they cope with injury, how they cope with um, changes to their access to teams, and so on. Um, since many of you are are also athletes either playing on teams or just in your your everyday lives engaging in sports activities um, many of you know how uh, your psychological state impacts your ability to perform in your sport i've talked to lots of student athletes who cope with performance anxiety who um, have struggled with a variety of mental health related challenges that are directly connected to their work in their sport. For example, many of my student athletes over the years have talked to me a lot about burnout. Um, others have talked about how, you know, one critical injury meant that they really lost the ability to perform in their sport and how difficult that was for them in terms of their identity moving forward. So there are lots of ways in which psychology is related to, um, to athletics and to sports. And that's what this field involves. Um, for, for many who are involved in sports psychology in one way or another, they may be working to understand how to improve performance, how to enhance it, as well as uh, providing treatment for issues that, that get in the way of performance. You probably recall you know, a, a real uptick in the conversation about sports psychology as we've had more and more athletes who are high profile um, coming forward and talking about the difficulties that they've had in terms of their mental health. Um, so that has raised the profile of sports psychology a great deal. <clears throat> to, to dig a little bit more deeply into what kind of topics uh, sports psychologists are concerned with, they, they may do things like teach athletes how to use visualization techniques to reduce anxiety or to target specific aspects of their performance. They may teach them specific techniques to reduce anxiety associated with performance. Um, as researchers, they may do research looking at how teams function. Um, how, how do you build a team that cooperates and works effectively as a unit? How do you um, help a team to avoid interpersonal conflicts um, and toxic kinds of competition within their team? All of those elements can interfere with the performance of the individuals, but also with the performance of the team. They may also look at the culture of the team. Um, if you have, for example, uh, just in the news in the last week or so, there have been reports of um, at uh, a D1 university, there was rampant hazing going on in some of the varsity men's sports. And what that speaks to is a culture of hostility and within the team competition that was fostered by the coaching staff. Um, that would be a cultural problem on that team um, and one that uh, needs to be broken down. There also needs to be um, 
psychological assistance provided to those who have been victimized in those sorts of circumstances. Some sports psychologists are primarily researchers. They may work in academia. They, they may work in clinical settings doing research. Um, they may also uh, do research in the, in the private or the public sector, either in government or in business settings. Um, others are, are much more on the clinical counseling, on the service delivery side, and they may work in um, the role of having a, a clinical practice. They may also consult. Um, so a team may bring in for a, for a short period of time um, a sports psychology consultant to deal with issues um, that the team is having. Or, you know, with a specific athlete who has a particular challenge, a sports psychologist may be brought in on a contingency basis to consult. Um, for many sports psychologists, they are, that may be their primary focus of their practice, or it may just be a component of their broader clinical or counseling practice. Um, some practicing sports psychologists also provide clinical and counseling services in other domains. Um, Donica Meyer, who is our internship supervisor and also teaches our sports psychology class, um, for example, is a licensed clinical licensed professional counselor. Um, and she also, though, um, does a lot of work with athletes. So sports psychology is one of her areas of specialization, but it is not the entirety of her practice nor was she trained specifically as a sports psychologist. So some clini clinicians, counselors, <clears throat> um, are interested in sport and will do work with athletes. Others have gone to, to graduate school specifically to study sports psychology, and that is their area of specialization. Um, this is analogous to the way if you want to be a health psychologist, you go to a clinical psychology program or a counseling program that specializes in health psychology. Same goes for sport. Um, if you know that that's the career path that you want to take, um, then you, you seek out a clinical or counseling program that has an area of specialization in sport psychology. Why that's beneficial is it can put you in the position where you can do your internship experiences and practicum in an athletic setting. Bachelor's degree opportunities, if you're interested in sport and athletics, are, are many and varied. Um, on the one hand, you have work in the fitness area, um, being a fitness instructor, being a recreational worker. And if you remember back to our chapter on health psychology, we also talked about recreational um, therapy. And these are kind of intersecting positions um, in, in the area of fitness. It can be helpful to have that psychology background because so much of what fitness instructors do involves motivation um, and uh, the ability to relate to people, to get um, higher levels of performance out of them, to make the work that you're encouraging them to do uh, enjoyable um, and assisting them to meet their goals. So if you're a fitness instructor, you know, you may have a specific domain of interest that is yours. Um, a good friend of mine is a, a licensed counselor, um, but she also is very athletic. So long, a long time ago, she uh, started to work at a fitness center and um, developed, she, she worked under a mentor and now is a, a fitness instructor. <clears throat> doing a variety of spin classes and things like that. There are also opportunities um, in <clears throat> local and regional recreation services to be a recreation supervisor. Um, you may be, you know, you notice above you have a recreational worker or well, someone needs to organize and supervise those individuals to create plans to communicate those programs to the broader community um, to oversee equipment, deal with the budget and all of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> fitness instructors, uh, 
from what I've seen in recent years, becoming a fitness instructor is becoming more more professionalized. Uh, it used to be a kind of you know learn as you go uh, experience with less oversight and um, regulation. It's becoming more and more common for fitness instructors and personal trainers to seek certification with organizations that can ensure you know ethical standards and <clears throat> various professional standards for that kind of work. So you know, you may be able to work with a mentor. Um, at a fitness, at a gym, um, or some other organization where you get a certain number of, of hours and time in. Um, but th then you may find that in order to increase your earning potential and <clears throat> your opportunities to move up in, in an organization, you may want to seek additional certifications that can require some coursework, um, hours under supervision, uh, and so on. Most employers who are looking for people as fitness instructors and personal trainers, they're going to look for a, um, a bachelor's degree in some sort of health related field, but that doesn't rule out psychology um, as a potential for that. And that's particularly if you are, um, if you are able to make it clear the way in which your psychology degree can contribute to your work in those areas. Dr. Torek Gerard, for example, has sought out her certification um, in uh, as a personal trainer, as a health coach, um, and she has done that with her background in psychology. A degree in psychology that if you combine that with um, some coursework in exercise science and nutrition is is often really helpful. So I've had among my advisees um, a, a handful of psychology majors who were either minors or double majors in exercise science who then went on to um, work directly in in the fitness industry. <clears throat> One, in fact, is a actually two. I have two who are professional personal trainers and they run their own businesses and then one other who is um, a health educator emphasizing nutrition so what he does with his clients is he he gives them you know nutritional information and advice uh, sometimes for to help them with disease management but, but mostly for health related reasons just wanting to improve their their diet and their um, their fitness level being a sport instructor or a coach is another area of interest for um, several of my advisees over the last few years. Um, I've had um, several students who wanted to go specifically into coaching um, and they were seeing their psychology major and their participation in collegiate sports as really meshing nicely together um, as they are seeking the experience necessary to become an instructor or a coach. Um, <clears throat> there are a variety of pathways into this kind of work. Um, if you want to become a, a sport instructor, there are you know academies for virtually every sport out there where you can become an instructor uh, to work with people at various ages. In some cases, you can find um, specific training in your sport is sufficient for becoming an instructor. So some people just sort of freelance and give lessons to people. Um, in other cases, it's much more organized. Like, for example, there's a baseball academy um, in Canton where they hire people with expertise in the various aspects of baseball to provide individual and group instruction. Coaching, um, especially if you're talking about at, in the K through 12 world, which is usually from the middle school level and up, um, that typically requires that you have the uh, prerequisite education background in order to perform in that role. And most states are gonna require some degree of certification or licensure um, to work with children. 
um, in that context. Uh, for many people um, who are coaches from the middle school level up, they are what are called dual hires. They, they teach in a subject matter area um, and they also coach an athletic team. Um, at very large schools uh, and, and many private schools, uh, especially at the high school level, you may have coaches in certain sports who are hired specifically and only for the purpose of coaching, say, a football team. <clears throat> With some sports, they may be kind of niche sports, so it's difficult to find individuals to coach those, those teams. Like as high schools have been adding lacrosse um, in recent years, it's been difficult to find among the teaching staff someone who is proficient enough to actually coach a, a lacrosse team. So an ind someone outside who has that skill and ability is hired um, to do that coaching. Um, my advice would be if coaching is something that's really interesting to you, um, we do have coaching courses um, and a coaching, a coaching minor, I believe it is, that you can complete um, that includes some of the the pieces and parts of of exercise science but also um, experience in um, the psychology of coaching as well as specific sport related um, practicum in learning how to coach in a particular sport um, obviously having a background in psychology can be helpful here um, as much of what you do involves communicating about people's attitudes, beliefs, and um, about their behavior. And, you know, adopting tactics are, are going to be highly motivational for people. Motivation and learning theory are, you know, pretty clearly related to being able to get the best performance out of athletes. Um, and that's regardless of the level that those individuals are at. Now, one note about coaching in college, coaching at the collegiate level, more and more and more is requires a graduate degree uh, of some kind. I'm not sure of the, the reasoning for that, but um, mostly it has to do with the fact that at many universities, um, individuals who are a part of the coaching staff may also be teaching um, or supervising uh, individuals who are at the bachelor's level. So more and more often, if you if you have like the goal of, of being a college level coach, um, you may find that you will be asked to, if you don't already have um, an advanced degree to get one. Um, sometimes these advanced degrees are in a specific area, a domain that's related to <clears throat> this to sport or to coaching. Um, in other cases, people will get their degrees in um, a higher education related area. So my advice again would be to seek out people who are doing that kind of work and talk to them about their educational pathway because um, they can give you the best advice. Another form of uh, education related a uh, bachelor's level opportunity is being a phys ed teacher. And we do at Mount Union have a program that can put people on the pathway to teaching in phys ed. So these are people who are um, employed in schools, uh, K through 12 schools, to promote um, uh, physical activity and health related behaviors. Um, many of these individuals as teachers are also going to teach health related content courses, um, but they, they also, I don't know if, if this is still the case, but I know when my kids were in high school, they had to do a certain number of PE credits, of physical education credits, um, which sometimes could be kind of laughable, like walking laps in the, on the basketball court, um, but in in other cases, PE programs are very complicated um, or not really complicated, but they have lots of different layers like teaching people how to play various sport uh, activities, learning the rules of those games, learning the basics of technique and so on. Um, so the, there are it, 
there is a quite a bit that needs to be learned in order to to perform in that position of being a PE instructor. Another part of it is is understanding um, how health related activities um, and exercise activities are connected to um, it, so, so social and emotional functioning in people. So having an understanding of cognition and uh, psychological development is going to be helpful to PE teachers so that they can um, effectively work with students to improve their health-related outcomes. Um, as I mentioned, um, most PE teachers are also going to teach um, a middle school and high school. At the middle school and high school level, they're also going to teach health classes. Um, and sometimes, you know, at the high school level, sometimes that involves sexuality education, um, or it may be more, more general health related classes, depending on the, the school system. PE, uh, teachers like other teachers have to be certified by the state. Um, and that means that in, for the most part, if you, you want to be a PE teacher, um, a major in education at the undergraduate level is going to be your most certain pathway um, to achieving that kind of position. Another bachelor's level opportunity for those of you who are also interested in writing is um, a, a career in journalism as a sports reporter. Um, now, if you're, you're thinking about this, for most people who work in this area, they're going to major in communication, specifically in journalism, um, and they have a strong interest in writing. Um, now, sport reporting can be done in various forms and various locations. It can be um, in the print media. Um, it can be in the online version of print media. It can be on social media. It can be um, uh, on video. Um, so on television networks, um, sports networks, and so on. So there's a lot of different forms that sport reporting can take. And there's a lot of uh, varied opportunities there. Um, so again, you know, most people who are seeing this as their, their preferred um, career path are going to seek out um, uh, an undergraduate major in, in journalism, um, perhaps second to that writing. Um, but I have had some psychology majors, this has been several, several years ago, who were really interested in sports. They loved writing about sports. They particularly loved writing about the psychological aspects of sport um, and talking about it. Um, so we had lots of conversations about how do I turn this into a career path? And sport reporting can be one possibility in that case. Sport reporters, um, in their, their work, need to um, seek out information. They have to, to develop stories. They have to either publish or broadcast the stories that they create. Um, they, they may also um, contribute to uh, projects where they're working with other reporters as well. Um, now, your authors, as you can see in this bullet point, they, they draw some, some similarities between what sport reporters are doing, like gathering information and preparing stories, is roughly analogous to building an argument and then presenting it in a paper um, and so on. So some of the skills that you're practicing and learning as a psychology student are going to be applicable to the work of reporting. Editors are someone that you would deal with as a sports reporter. So you're working with a team um, of people who, who need to make sure that your information is accurate and effective as a communication tool. So you'll be reporting to an editor. Um, if journalism is something that really interests you, um, some people will start out on the reporting beat and then they will rise to the level of editor. And that concludes part one of my coverage of chapter seven.